I have a one-year-old and a three-year-old at home, and I have a perpetual cold. So I have a lozenge and some hot tea. So hopefully we'll get through the next few minutes. But I'm also the last person before break, so I'll try to be expeditious with my remarks. So thank you again, Jean, for including me on the agenda. After hearing all the um, remarks from the various representatives from the different societies, I'm glad to say that NHGRI is, is um, leading an effort to develop a, a resource of clinically relevant genetic variants. And something that we've recognized early on is that in order for this to be successful, we really need the input of the professional societies, clinical organizations, and other stakeholders early and often so we ensure that the end result is useful to the end users, the clinical community. So many of you are familiar with the Nature publication in February 2011 where NHGRI outlined the vision for genomics over the course of the next 10 years or so. And in that paper, there's the imperatives for genomics medicine figure or box. One of those imperatives is that we need practical systems for clinical genomic informatics, a point that's been alluded to many times throughout the course of the day. We all know that many variants associated with disease risk and treatment response are known. Many more will be continued to be discovered. And new models for capturing and displaying these variants and their phenotypic consequences should be developed and incorporated into systems, practical systems, that make information available to patients and their healthcare providers. And I think in, implicit in this, before we get to that latter part, is that we really do, we've heard this today, we need synthesis and evaluation of the available data and evidence to identify clinically relevant variants and make sure that we, when we produce such a resource, it's, um, the data is presented in a way that's consumable by EHRs and other point of care decision tools. So as I said in the, um, the February 2011 vision statement, this is sort of for the entire genomics community, but as we progressed through the year in 2011, we heard more and more at a variety of meetings, including I believe the first genomic medicine meeting, that NHGRI would be well positioned to play a role in, co in helping to bring the communities together to develop, to develop such a resource. So with that in mind, we organized a, a workshop back in December of 2011, so just over a year ago now, characterizing and displaying genetic variants for clinical action. The goal for this workshop, and many of you were there, Mark Williams and Rex Chisholm were our co-chairs, was to consider the processes, databases, and other resources needed to identify clinically relevant variants, decide whether they're actionable and what the action should be, and then provide this information for consideration for clinical use. There's over a dozen or so recommendations, and I'll just highlight one or two, which brings us to the point of the development of, of this resource. So there really was um, agreement in the workshop that, that NHGRI was well positioned to support a resource to ex extend the existing databases of genotype-phenotype correlation, um, curating them, adding more, more information on phenotypes, um, and coming, coming up with ways to develop consent. Clinically, clinical utility and actionability. actionability. Again, the notion of NHGRI sort of serving as a convener, so bringing together other relevant NIH institutes, professional organizations like all of you around the table and other stakeholders to develop these recommendations regarding clinical relevance, actionability, utility of genetic variants. Another interesting um, recommendation is, is, is relevant here, develop competitions to promote um, development of algorithms for interpreting genomic variants and compare performance. So it's a little bit different from the conversation we're having today, but again, it's, I think we'd like to, to develop more automated methods to evaluate this increasing, these increasing numbers of genetic variants as we move forward. If you're interested in, in hearing more, listening to the talks or reading the summaries, you can find them at uh, the listed URL. And this is a very um, simple um, figure I'm about to, to show you, but basically we all know, you better than I, that there's a complex decision-making process when we, we're trying to decide what genetic variants to use in the clinical setting. We have resources already, genotype, phenotype resources that answer the question, what is related? Um, there's the NHGRI GWAS catalog, OMIM, ClinVar, which is a new database being developed by NCBI at the NIH. There's other resources like ISCA and PharmGKB that also have 
added value information on top of the genotype-phenotype correlations. But ultimately, what will be done comes down to the clinicians, the institutions, the payers, and, and the patients, and there's a big gap between these two boxes. And so what could be done is, as we talked about, assembling the information on clinically relevant genetic variants and their supporting evidence so that clinicians don't have to reach all the way back to these, um, these genotype-phenotype databases, and then they, they can go to a place that has this information assembled in a way that is useful to them. And I just have these arrows here. We've heard Mark ask often, you know, what, how are you evaluating outcomes? Are we learning how, about um, any improvements of using this information? And we just want to recognize that any kind of information we get on outcomes, that all needs to be fed back into these different resources. And we want the clinically relevant variance resource or any other similar resources to be nimble enough to be able to incorporate that data to make sure that the, the um, information is updated as new knowledge is being generated so we have the most accurate information moving forward. So based on the workshop and sort of the thought that we've put into this with many of our colleagues, we developed an RFA. The purpose of the RFA, again, is to support a process for the identification and dissemination of consensus information on genetic variants. And I, I say process here because we recognize we need to sort of come together and develop a framework, methods that we can apply to this existing data, sort of generate a pipeline so that we can apply it to genetic variants moving forward as we learn more and more. The goals identify genetic variants with likely implications for clinical care, establish a process for transferring this information to appropriate clinical organizations for guideline development, because we know all of you are the ones that make the guidelines that the, the clinicians use and abide by. And we, so we want to make sure, again, that we get, we hear from you, what evidence do you need? What do you use to make these recommendations? Um, so we can ensure that, as to the extent possible, we include that in such a resource, or at least we identify where there are gaps and identify avenues for collecting that information. And then importantly, build upon existing programs, unify, reduce duplicative efforts across research clinical organizations. This is happening in so many places across the country and around the world, which is a good thing, but anything that we can do to, to bring folks together to, to come up with you know, a standard framework or consensus approaches to evaluating this data will be helpful to all of us. So what we're using here for this this RFA, um, the applications have already come in and they're being reviewed. We hope to launch the program in the summer of this year. It's a cooperative agreement mechanism, which just allows NHGRI to work closely with the awardee and the other, um, other collaborator collaborators to ensure we're, we're reaching our goals with this program. We have mon money set aside through, through the next four years. Um, again, we'd like to kick off the program in hopefully summer of this year. And we'll be watching it closely to, to evaluate you know, the effectiveness of such a resource. We'd also like to see over time you know, semi-automated and automated methods of sort of curation and annotation being developed so that this process um, perhaps would get a little bit more affordable and easier to implement over time as sort of the wealth of genomic information is continuing to be developed. So there's some key aspects of the program under synthesis and curation. We're expecting the grantee to survey existing efforts, solicit participation from relevant groups. Again, I've alluded to developing a framework for evaluating the available data and assessing the degree of potential clinical relevance. So you may think of sort of binning um, different categories of variants in, in a variety of bins. It could relate to clinical utility and actionability. And then generate a set of genes, variants, and supporting evidence for evaluation of clinical relevant, so apply this framework to an existing set of genes and variants, and importantly, developing approaches for distributing the curation and the review of variants. One approach I th think could be um, successful, and it's sort of evident by the different societies around the room, is if we have um, different specialties come together, so ophthalmology, GI, rheumatology, um, all these different specialties, heart and lung, pediatrics and bring together experts, sort of the clinical lab expertise, the phenotype, the disease knowledge, the medical genetics expertise, have them come together in specialized working groups and then evaluate the data that's been synthesized 
through this, the clinically relevant um, variance resource program to come up with some consensus on sort of what, what variants bubble to the top and would be of most, um, cl would be most clinically relevant at this point in time, and also identify those that might be not quite there but are, are close. We have some interesting data. We need a little bit more evidence and try to understand what additional evidence do we need and, and sort of think about the pathway to collecting that data. Dissemination, again, vetting the specifications early and often with folks like yourselves of the resource. We want this, and we heard others in their survey data acknowledge that the users need something that's user-friendly, easy to search. Um, that includes uh, the supporting evidence, so there's an understanding of what data was used to make the decisions, and then what actions could be taken in the clinic. It's important, obviously, to ensure integration with other data resources. So we were thinking of you know, making sure that the, the formats we use are um, interoperable with other existing efforts. And then, again, not only disseminating the information on the genetic variants to the clinical community through this resource, but also our approach and our framework. So if other folks want to adopt a similar framework in different settings or you know, in the UK, in different places, that they may consider using the same approach that we did. And I think the most important part of this, um, in my mind, and why I'm, I'm happy to be here, is again ensuring coordination with related efforts. So um, we have, you know, we know that EGAP has thought a lot about the approaches for evaluating this information. Um, the PGRN CPIC, they've already done some of this work um, with pharmacogenomic variants. NHGRI supports other programs like Emerge and CSER that are generating new um, pieces of data. They're also thinking about actionable variants that sort of bubble to the surface in their programs. And then, very importantly, the professional societies, all of you. And to that point, I just want to close with, within this RFA, we actually plan to develop a professional organizations committee. So this fits in really nicely with sort of the, the discussion we'll have after the break. Again, we'd, we'd like to bring all of you together as this resource is developed and moved forward to not only give us input on the development and the use of this resource, but also to facilitate interactions between you. We'd like to hear more about you know, what kind of evidence, the level of evidence that you need to make these practice guidelines. And we've also heard sort of there's different levels of practice guidelines, maybe not practice guidelines, but the next tier underneath that. Um, I forget, someone referred to maybe it was recommendations um, and various other sort of consensus statements. And so, you know, what can, we, what can we put in this resource that will help you evaluate the data and, and produce these statements and um, guidelines more quickly? And as I said, we'll, we'll plan to launch the program in the summer. We'd like to gather many of you, those of you that are interested, and, and hopefully I can work with you to identify the, the point person that would be interested and willing to commit to such an effort. Um, mostly we'd get together through teleconferences, but we'd like to have joint meeting with the steering committee of the program once a year, and then you know, have the representatives from this organization attend the steering committee meeting. So, I'll close with that and just say you'll, you'll be hearing from me um, in the near future as we start to pull this committee together, um, and I look forward to working with many of you in the near future. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Comments or questions for Aaron? Jean. It seems like you're thinking, Aaron, about perhaps establishing a society of societies. Um, is that what's in your mind? Well, um, yeah, we called it the, the or Professional Organizations Committee, but again, we just like to bring many of you together. We recognize everyone's busy, but we really think that it's critical to get input from all of you um, as soon as possible to make sure that we're, we're thinking in the right, you know, we're in the right frame of mind as we're developing this resource. Aaron, uh, I note that, uh, I, that the Wellcome Trust co-sponsored the original workshop we had. Do we know what, what they or other funding agencies are doing in this area, either based on that workshop or independently? Um, we've had, so there is a, um, a manuscript that should be coming out from this workshop any, any day now. And so through, through the development of that manuscript, I've had some um, conversation with 
Tim, Hubbard, Tim Hubbard and other folks at the Wellcome, but I, from, from what I understand at this point, they haven't invested any, in, any funds in this area, but they're certainly interested in what we're doing um, moving forward. Heidi. So I can just follow up on that question. I was just uh, in England yes, yesterday, the day before, with Tony Brooks, and he was commenting that there is an initiative related to Healthy 2020 in, um, in Europe and with interest in funding activities in this area. And Tony is in the process trying to propose um, a meeting in April in Ireland related to um, variant assessment, pathogenicity, organizing gene resources. So there, there does seem to be some interest in, in, in funding activities in this area, but I think there's still not clarity as of yet. Emily. <laughs> Thanks for that talk. Um, of the resources we need, I mean, one of the things we need is just more data on what these variants do. Mm -hmm. And I see a database for variants that are juried. Is a component of this collecting more evidence that allows us to jury these variants? Uh, yeah, I mean, we recognize that's really an important aspect of this entire pipeline. And there are efforts, so I've talked about ClinVar, and there are efforts um, in the research community to try to, to pull together various labs and other research groups to deposit information on, you know, what they're seeing in the clinic as they're applying clinical sequencing um, to establish, you know, to, to build up that knowledge base so then we can sort of figure out what bubbles to the surface as we, as we vet them. Terry? Yeah, I, I, I think Gail makes a, makes a good point um, in, in terms of the, the need for additional evidence, which we recognize. We wouldn't do that probably as an integral part of this initiative, which has a you know, specific focus and a target. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that we would like to, to hear from that resource as it develops, as we would like to hear from the professional societies, is where, you know, what kinds of evidence are needed, what would be convincing to them, um, where, where are points that are, that are almost there, and if we only had this piece of information, we would, we would know one way or the other. Um, so that's what we're hoping for. And it gets back to the business of randomized clinical trials or something proximal to it, doesn't it? Really? So, Bob. I think on that topic, I realize that, you know, uh, thank you very much, Aaron. I think that that initiative you have is certainly in what we're all about today is to better educate and how to get it out to the clinical application and to look at those clinical applications. But certainly, uh, I know that the, the Wellcome Trust is interested in collecting the variants for multiple diseases and what they are hoping to do, and I'm so hoping, but I would like to bring this point to, because as I indicated, for coronary artery disease, it's similar for diabetes, it's similar for many societies. Of these variants, most of them are not acting through the conventional risk factors, and yet it's hard to believe that they're all acting through a different mechanism. They must be acting through two, three, or four, or five different uh, systems. And I think that, again, this is a very complicated area. It needs lots of bioinformatics that I think is going to be done individually. and It'll take decades. On the other hand, this is the kind of project that the people who collect all the variants and have all of that data, somewhere along the line, it's easier to put together some framework that would be very helpful for us in terms of individual laboratories to do. I hope that would be the case. Yeah, and I, I think this is really going to be important to kind of set a community standard here because we've certainly heard about, uh, in, the, in the context of the discussions around patents, and the fact that patents may ultimately not be uh, upheld or will expire related to human genes. Uh, there have been some uh, that have expressed that uh, they will um, deal with this issue by um, in, in, uh, imposing trade secrets on uh, interpretive information associated with variants and that that's the business model uh, going forward. So uh, that would be disastrous, uh, I think, for uh, uh, the group as a whole because uh, the trade secrets, of course, do not expire, uh, as Koch can uh, attest. Uh, so uh, I think that if we can really set a community standard of uh, collaboration and communication of results, and it would be uh, hard 
uh, to hold against uh, that type of, uh, uh, of an effort. And that, I just want to say that's why I try to emphasize the, 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 the keywords process and framework. I mean, ultimately, the end result will be this database, but just as important is, is developing this sort of pipeline, these processes. So we're, we're all sort of approaching it the same way. Now, Mary, are you sure you have a question now? <laughs> sure. Um, so help, can you help me understand? I feel like I've asked this question a couple times before, but here it goes again. Um, how compare and contrast ClinVar to CRVR? So the way that I'm envisioning, and we have been talking quite a bit with our colleagues at NCBI that are developing ClinVar. ClinVar, and if you think about sort of the genotype phenotype correlation, ClinVar is serving as the repository of, you know, an archive data repository of genetic variants and then the sort of the correlation with a variety of phenotypes. Um, what, what we see, I don't envision that they're going to have sort of the, the, the evidence on clinical utility, um, sort of other pieces of, of data that one might evaluate for deciding if something is uh, clinically reaches the standard of clinical utility or not. So we see ClinVar as sort of one of our primary data points. So as clinical labs, um, from my understanding, are considering um, depositing information directly into ClinVar, sort of the, 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 we'll have an increased number, uh, increased information on you know, variants with a variety of phenotypes. But then our resource and our process will come in, use ClinVar as one of the primary pieces of data, figure out what other piece of evidence do we need that's not in ClinVar to decide if something is clinically actionable or you know, reaches that, that point of clinical utility. And then that information, so there's that top tier of variants would be displayed through this database. Does so you, you will have further clinical utility information Right. Above and beyond what's planned to be in ClinVar, which will explain any associations between variants, be they clinical right. or otherwise. Right. And you know, they I mean, envision variants of unknown significance. They, they would like to, you know, to think about the entire genome. So as much information that they can have on, a, on each variant in the genome, you know, and you can envision that's probably not going to, it'll be um, broad, but not perhaps very I'm not using the right words. Um, you know, they, they just want to make sure that every variant has some piece of information associated with it, but they won't have sort of the, the curation level efforts to pull in the sort of the other pieces of, of data that will need to be used to decide on clinical utility. And, and plus, the, the CRVR will have a consensus process uh, developed and applied to, to the variants they get. So, so there will not only be the curation, but, but a group of experts, right. for want of a, better, of a better term, that will review that information, much like Mu CPIC. Much more selective. Yes. Yes, it, it's definitely much more like the CPIC approach. Other comments? Yes. Uh, One last comment. I mean, I think also, certainly from speaking for the polygenic disorders, uh, it's good to keep in mind that all we have is a SNP in a region in 90% of the cases. Mm -hmm. And so if you collect data from different disciplines, stroke, heart disease, diabetes, uh, I think there's a lot to be gained by, because we are claiming different SNPs when we're all sometimes only within a few thousand base pairs of each other. It associates with diabetes that part of the molecule. This one associates, it may well be the same molecule or altered in splice form or different domain of the same. That will be much easier if you're collecting multiple phenotypes with the, with the SNPs to put it together which I think none of us who are all interested in our own disease would like to do. Excellent point. Uh, last comment, Jonas. I'm just trying to understand CRVR framework. So is this something like the TCGA, but without selecting the population that is being sampled? Say that again, something like the what? The, the cancer genome atlas, in the sense that you have multiple phenotypic instances of, the, of variances that may be the same. Um, well, I think in in this regard, and the reason I, I put up sort of the different phenotypes or disease categories is that it's just that we, we recognize there are ex examples of, you know, some variants that act in different, um, act in different disease pathways, but the, uh, the approach that we planned to take was really just sort of thinking about um, disseminating curation efforts. So we'd like to sort of pull together the disease experts um, together with the medical geneticists um, 
to evaluate the evidence at hand and then make decisions on the clinical relevance of variants sort of in each of those disease settings. And I could, could add that the, the Cancer Genome Atlas is actually generating the evidence. So they're doing the sequencing, they're identifying the variants, they're looking at the phenotypes. Th this is really focused on taking what's existing out there, you know, so what, what existing literature and, and information is available and then putting a consensus process on it with the hope that there will be continued, you know, generation of new evidence as, as time goes by. So we've, we've generated some further comments. Maybe we'll take two more. So we had John and someone else. Who, others, who else's yeah. hand did I see? I'm curious if you are, are considering uh, linkages to equilibrium as a curation as uh, in terms of uh, imputation or using the uh, markers that might be done and what they might mean in their neighborhood? I think that's a, a valid comment and I think when we get down to that level of detail it's sort of up to the, the grantee and the approach that they want to take sort of to assemble all this information and make decisions on how we're going to evaluate it moving forward. But it's a, it's a good thought to keep in mind. I mean, we're, we're not in a position right now to design the, the project because we're, we're in that sensitive period when applications are in and being reviewed. But a good thought for us to consider. So, thank you. Uh, anything else? Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Um, so I think we're, we're up to a break. We're going to take a full 30-minute break so that we give Jean and Mark uh, a little bit of time to put their, their efforts together for our next um, discussion. So we'll come back at 20 minutes to 4, and we'll give you a two-minute warning. Thank you.